Hey folks, Blackcross here. Welcome back to another rendition of Deep Dive into Gaming. If you're new to this series, chances are I need to explain a few things. What I normally do is that when it comes to a game, I usually do like a retrospective feel or at least some form of like how I feel about towards the game or game series, depending on the game per se, and what my life was like whenever I was playing that game, or per se, more or less small stories and interesting facts about myself involving with the game per se. This time, however, it was a recently discovered game that I had just recently played, and I feel like I need to kind of explain myself as to what encouraged me to either look for it, grab it, and then eventually play it overall. And it is... I, I, for some people, this may look like boasting a game and everything like that, and admittedly so, it does sound it. But when you look at it through the perspective of, like, who I am and everything like that, it's more or less explaining of, like, what type of games I usually go for, and what type of games are my... I suppose the word would be niche, in terms of what I grab. So, let's go ahead and kind of go into the discussion of, like, what games drive me into wanting to nab them. Because as I'm sure you've noticed from my collection per se, as well as the Let's Play that you've seen on my channel, there's tend to be a common trend. And they are three different categories. There's hack and slash, RPGs, and Avenger games. Now, with these three individually, they do like have separate categories in their own traditional way. For example, you have the hack and slash games, where it sort of like plays into either that of No More Heroes, Killer is Dead, uh, Metal Gear Rising, or in some instances, it could be that of Dynasty Warriors like game, for example, Sinkoku, Boss Rai, Samurai Heroes, or Legend of Zelda, Hyrule Warriors. Then you've got the RPGs, or JRPGs, whichever one is more or less the politically correct term that I am mostly attracted to. And there's usually like Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, and a few little odd podge here and there to some degree. For example, like Dark Souls and Bloodborne. They are in their own right RPGs, but they play differently in both categories. For example, you've got like the standalone turn-based RPGs, and then you've got the action RPGs, and then you got some of the more obscure and weirder RPGs that are made. Not in terms of style, but in terms of how the game is played. And then you've got Avenger games, where they usually vary in any form of way. Sometimes the only thing you're doing is more or less of a walk simulator, where you move the character forward, and the story itself unfolds as you go forward continuously all the time. Sort of like how, uh, I suppose Limbo is like that, um, Inside I believe is another one, and then of course Journey, where all you do is just move forward through the story itself. You don't interact in terms of combat. You more or less just move like the platforms in order to continue forward. And the story unravels itself in order to display like some form of a story to you to which you have to interpret yourself of what the, sto of the story is. And sometimes those aren't bad. But when you look at the games that I'm usually drawn to, those adventure games have combat to some degree. I only talk about this because those three areas are more or less what drives me in terms of what makes me want to grab the game per se. There's the hack and slash aspects of things, there's the RPG general direction, and then there is the world layout, which is adventure games. Action adventure RPGs. Now, lately these games tend to go into two different types of categories. You have the mainstream thing that we're going to right now, where every RPG or any particular RPG in general that is made is now being put into an open world scale. And they're not bad per se, but they do lack in terms of like 
once you get open world out there, everything else tends to lack in terms of, like, quality. In other words, they believe that the quantity of the big, massive world that you explore outweighs the quality of the gameplay, the side missions, and everything else in general. And while that's one thing, there is one other key detail that does actually end up grabbing my attention when it comes to games. And sometimes this particular subject in hands can grab me in ways that most people would think seems weird and stupid. But at the same time, it's something that I actually personally enjoy. And that is the bosses in video games. Now, depending on who you are, these bosses can be summarized into two or three categories. I say two or three because the third one is a rare instance. And because of that, there's not many of them that stand out in terms of like technical bosses. By saying technical boss, I mean the ultimate goal of the end level. So when it comes down to it, the bosses can be summarized into A being that of the 3D field of bosses, B being that of the 2D field of bosses, and then the oddball of the boss himself. And it could be just something that either plays a part into the main story that doesn't really have combat, or it can be an interactivity of a puzzle game in order to defeat said boss. In other words, you're not interacting with the boss, you're interacting with the environments to involve with the boss per se. But like I said, that's a rare instance. What we're talking about is the 2D and 3D field of bosses. And these are usually the ones that grab my attention the most. If they look interesting enough to where it's like, you know what, I'll pick this up. That's whenever you get my attention sometimes. I prefer 3D field of combat. But if there's enough bosses inside of a 2D side-scrolling game, I might be willing to pick it up just in order to explore how the bosses are. And the chances are they're going to be far in between of really good and something that I don't quite like. It's one of those things where it's like, unless there's like a key access that I enjoy, I'm going to enjoy fighting the bosses more and more. If there is a mechanic that I don't like, chances are I'm not going to enjoy the game as much. But that's where Blood Will Tell comes into play. Blood Will Tell actually has a concept of you fighting 48 fiends in order to regain your body parts. 48 fiends. 48 demons that you'll be fighting. Now... That is a lot when you consider the fact that the most amount of bosses that I've ever fought in a game is Dark Souls 3, which is a total of 30 after DLC. Best part about Blood Will Tell is that other than the main story, which are like, I want to say like half of the demons that you have to fight are accessible, and then the other half you have to look for. And that's actually where the best part comes into play. So imagine the scenario that I have envisioned where basically you go through the game and you fight like maybe five or six bosses but then the majority of the game is an open world concept and you look for the bosses in order to fight them. Now technically Blood Would Tell isn't really open world per se but because you can go back into the previous chapters after you play through them once and explore them rather than reiterate the same story that you had been before, which is a nice change, which is a nice thing. You don't have to replay the level, you just go through the level from the very beginning and try to look for the demons that you might have missed. That's something that I actually appreciate. So, in that aspect, it makes the game into like an open level to where you explore the bosses. Because of the fact that technically these levels are elongated and big, Therefore, it encouraged exploration in order to look for small crannies that the bosses might appear in. And depending on where you are in the game can depend on how challenging the boss per se can be. In terms of like, when you discover them. So, as I was playing through the main story of Blood Would Tell, I wanted to play more, but I didn't have enough time in order to actually do a full on record section of Blood Would Tell. So I started a new profile and just went through the main story itself. This time actually looking for individual nooks and crannies to see what I've missed. And sure enough, I've missed quite a bit in the first chapter alone. 
And it's because of the first chapter that I discovered that these particular bosses are a little bit more challenging than whenever I fought them in my main playthrough of Blood Would Tell. And that can be a little bit of a downside is that depending on where you are at in the story of the game, you can easily overpower the demons themselves. And by overpower, I mean insanely overpowered. First and foremost, we got the fact that technically in this game, you have basically a handicap with you at all times. Record, you have the dual blades, you've got the machine gun, and you've got the cannon at your disposal. But ultimately, you are kind of handicapped in that aspect. Proof of that is the fact that when you play the game and you beat the second fiend, you have the ability to see color because when you first start the game, you're seeing black and white. So in that aspect, you are handicapped. But it isn't until like literally after chapter three or chapter four that something takes place and that is a change of gameplay. The gameplay is usually standard to some degree. However, as you go further into the game of the main story and discover more body parts, you then realize that a potential breakthrough comes into play. That being that the combat changes over time. In other words, your combos, your attack moves, everything in general improves for every body part that you get. In other words, you get stronger for every body part you attain, and that makes it more and more of a want in order to find the individual fiends themselves to get those body parts and to make you stronger. Keep in mind, you don't technically level up, but your arm blades do level up. But do they matter in terms of the grand scheme of things? Sadly, until you get to chapter 6, not so much. In this particular chapter of chapter 5, you've recently discovered that technically, one of the fiends have a crucial body part, being that of your left arm. That left arm actually changes the gameplay dramatically, to a point to where it makes you even stronger because it got rid of one of your own blades, arm blades that you have and replaces it with an actual samurai sword blade. Now, if you've been watching the game, you know that there are two phases. There is the two arm phase, and then there is the single blade phase. And I didn't realize it, but apparently the one blade move versus the two blade move is actually stronger compared to the two. It's weird, but it's very much more true than you think. Most samurais wield one sword because of both arms being implemented and using more of a striking move to deal more damage. Using two swords, yes, you have more of a vantage point, but you're not going to get that devastating blow that you have originated in order to deliver. The one blade is actually more powerful than two blades themselves. And so after I've attained the left arm of Yakimaru, Basically, this kind of changed the game dramatically into a point where the game became a lot more easier to manage. And at, a, at the end of the day, I realized that technically I no longer needed the two blade move and instead I just stuck with the one blade move almost all the way through at that point because of how much more powerful I became. So at the end of the day, when you f go out of your way to search for these individual fiends, you get stronger and stronger as you progress through the game, and the gameplay changes continuously as you continue forward through the game. And in the aspect of saying this is technically what I wanted in terms of like how the game I wanted to envision for bosses to be, where each individual boss you kill give you a massive bonus and it drives the person to want to look for them even further. So in terms of it all, while Blood Will Tell has perfect elements that I have looked for in a game for a long time, it does suffer quite a bit. First and foremost, as far as I know, there isn't really a new game plus that you can play with all the body parts attained. And there is no replayability other than the fact that technically there's a segment after you beat the main game where you play as Dororo, but he's looking for a treasure. Yeah, um, this is your highlight, I guess. Supposedly. 
And then if that's not the other case, you then also have the fact that technically, while these bosses are very well designed, and each one of them have their own different aspects of moves to some degree, even the repeated bosses tend to change up from time to time and get stronger, if you get to a point in the game where you're able to get drastically stronger, then at the end of the day, those bosses are very weak in the end of the day. So, at the strong aspect, if you do discover your left arm in the game, that's when you can say that it's going to be easy mode throughout the time. And I kind of wish they hadn't have made it that way, because then, immediately you wouldn't be using the majority of your other tools at your arsenal. You'd be doing the one move because it's the strongest in your arsenal. Then again, it could be because of the fact that the blade that I was using actually has like a slash aftermath, where it shoots out like a slash move and does the expected damage that you see. So it could be a combination of the fact that technically I did get the left arm and the fact that I got a really powerful blade. It could be of those two natures. And that's what made the majority of the game pretty easy on its own field. But that's where I made a slight miscalculation. I actually thought that the main game after you got to that point was going to be pretty easy. That was until I killed 47 of the 48 fiends. By the time I got to the final fiend, being the final boss, I was sadly mistaken. This thing is so freaking crazy. It is a four stage boss fight. I was completely out of my mind whenever I got to that point. I'm used to fighting a boss that's like up to three phases. When you throw me one that has a fourth phase, I'm like, what the hell do I do? But that's what I like the best about Blood Would Tell. It throws you a unexpected boss in your direction, and you have to learn the moves in order to figure out how to fight it the best way. It's sort of like Dark Souls in a way, except it's not that hard. After the first initial death, chances are you've learned something from that death, and you are able to avoid it and fight it better the next round. In the final boss case, however, it took me like four tries before I finally beat it, and that's only because I didn't know what I had to do at the end of the day. I will tell you this much, it is best to examine all of your blades before thinking that you've run out of options. I did not realize that the, uh, that the blade of Twin Clouds actually doubled the amount of slash combos that you do when you use the slash move. And apparently there are other blades that allows you to do multitudes of slashes, and had I gotten those, it would have been a lot easier, but I didn't realize that because technically the blade is pretty weak compared to the main one that I had. So it's one of those you have to change out once you get to that point. After that, the rest of the game ain't that bad. So in terms of like grading the game of Blood Would Tell, what score would I give it? If it was me and I had to give it appropriate score, I would probably give it a 7 0.5 or an 8 out of 10. And that's only because there are some slow segments, for example you play as Doro, and they do kind of slow down the game to some degree. As for the main game where you play as Yakimaru, it gradually gets better and you're more intrigued rather than like, why did they do it this way? But because of the fact of how the story is and how the gameplay works, you appreciate the concept of how Gradually you get better and how everything else makes it ultimately a more epic tale. Although, even though I say this now, and even though I clearly would say this much, I would place Blood Would Tell either at my 6th or 5th favorite games of top 10 favorite games of all times, and that says a lot. I think the most recent retro game that I've recently added in the past like 5 years that I've started going back into it was actually Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne, and that was a wonderful experience for me. Blood Would Tell matches just as much as that did, and more. It was quite an amazing feat. But, I think the biggest question that most collectors will ask, was it worth the initial price? Keep in mind, I paid $170 for Blood Would Tell, and when I say that, I mean it literally. It is not cheap. Keep in mind, imagine if you will that the game came out back then in the day. It probably got poor receptions and never got looked into, and therefore didn't sell as many copies. 
Now, in this day and age where retro games are being resold and everything like that, the price for the game itself has skyrocketed. At this point, you're lucky if you can get a game for less than 100 bucks. If you can, not many people were looking into it and you were lucky enough to get it at a low end bid. If you're wanting it brand new, you're about to pay 300 bucks for it. Brand new. They actually do have a brand new copy on eBay. You're welcome to look for yourself, but in all honesty, it's one of those things where it's like, unless they show the actual image of the brand new package itself with the actual seal and everything like that, it's going to be a gamble. But, the question rings, is it worth the price to pay for Blood Would Tell? Any normal collector I would actually say yes to. If you are a collector of retro PlayStation 2 games, this is that one game you have to pick up. It is that good. In my personal opinion, I loved it, and it's the ideal game that I usually go for. Absolutely one of my favorites. For any casual gamer, however, I would not recommend it to them. If you're lucky enough to have a friend who has a copy, borrow it from them and judge it based on that access. But because of the fact that a casual gamer wouldn't understand, I wouldn't recommend them to actually pick up this game in order to have that feeling of if it was going to be good or not. Especially since 170 bucks is practically almost over the initial price of a single brand new title nowadays. Actually, I think it's almost like three times at that point when you think about it. But that's not the most irritating thing. Record, yes. Pricey retro games is an irritating subject. But another subject rings into my head, and it's because of Blood Would Tell that made me look into the ideal specs of like, well, it could have been prevented. And by prevented, I mean Sony could have prevented it. Or maybe Sega, which everyone is responsible for distributing retro games putting onto the PlayStation 4. What I mean is, is that Sony could have easily put any retro title onto the PlayStation 4. However, though, there is another painstaking issue, and that is copyright. Copyright is a very big issue these days, and it can vary depending on the situation. Yes, Sony could easily want to put Bloodwood Tell onto the PlayStation 4 for players to get into. In fact, if they wanted to, they could have easily had it sold for $20, and they would have had an instant seller in terms of digital downloads. They would have no problem selling copies of Bloodwood Tell had it made been available onto the PlayStation Store. But they didn't. If they wanted to, that's one thing. It could be a Sega issue where Sega wants nothing to do with any of their retro titles and they want to push more of their newer titles out there. And for it being Sega, I sincerely doubt they're going to put anything out new that is going to be like groundbreaking. So honestly, I kind of wish Sony would actually break their own laws and actually say, okay, there's a lot of PlayStation 2, a lot of PlayStation 1 titles that people love, let's try to put them onto the PlayStation 4, PlayStation Store in general. I kind of wish they would do more of that, but unfortunately the last retro title we've had onto the PlayStation 4 that I can think of is that of Final Fantasy IX, and that's major retro titles. I'm talking like major retro titles, not digital downloads or anything like that, arcade favorite or whatever. I'm talking actual title that was released for the PlayStation and PlayStation 2 and re-release digital download wise for the PlayStation Store. Although I will say this much, Sony, if you actually do agree to actually hands down, no bargain or anything like that, if you actually decide to release these games digital download, I would actually go full on every week purchase a new retro title digitally on from the PlayStation Store. But that's if you do it. If you do it. If you do it. And that's a big if. And I'm not asking for every title. Obviously you can't do that for every game, but if you did it for certain titles, for example, like I said, Blood Would Tell, Sky Gunner, the games that people want to see more of onto the PlayStation Store, you might actually get some encouraging sales. But then again, it could be an individual publisher problem itself. They may not want those titles on the PlayStation Store. They may want their newer stuff. And if that's the case, what's going to hurt you? If nothing else, it's going to make you money in the long run. But 
there could be multiple issues, there could be multiple reasons, and it's one of those reasons why it's just irritating for me. But anyway though, I kind of went on a little bit of a rant afterwards after talking about Blood Would Tell, but I just wanted to kind of give you an ideal subject of the fact that, yes, Blood Would Tell is an amazing game for any collector out there and for any enthusiast of gaming. For anyone who is a casual, they may not find it worth the price of admission just because of it all. And it is an irritating thing because that means not a lot of people can enjoy the appreciation of Blood Would Tell compared to what I enjoyed it. Keep in mind, like I said, I paid 170 bucks and I felt like it was well worth it. But for other people, it may not seem as worth it to most. And I can understand that. It is very possible that I could have easily gotten it cheaper, but at the time that I was looking, there was no cheaper option. That one was like the cheapest that I could find, whereas the next cheaper one was like 200 bucks. You see my point. <laughs> it's not cheap. But anyway though, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed me talking about this particular game in a retrospective feel and deep dive into gaming, let me know in the comments below and I'll probably bring up other games that I have previously played on this channel and talk about my feelings towards them, you know? Maybe you're interested as to why I stopped playing uh, Fallout 4 after starting it. Maybe you're curious about another game that I recently played and you want to know more about my thoughts towards that game. Who knows? But anyway though, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. This is Blackcross signing off. Catch you later guys.